us to pray this morning. Um, I woke up very early this morning and uh, checked my email and saw where Franklin Graham, who I think is such an important voice to our nation, has asked all churches across the country today to take a moment and pray for our nation. Many of you are watching in the news what's going on, the rioting, the protesting, all of the racial division and hurts. And um, my, 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 this country continues to move further away from the Lord, doesn't it? And there isn't anything that's going to heal us according to the Bible. There isn't anything that is going to heal our land other than God's people praying. We have to lead the way. Scripture says, if, what a condition, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Will you join me this morning and may we pray for our country. Father, we pray for this great nation, this nation that you have raised up, this nation that is uh, what it is by the sovereign decree of the Lord. We thank you, God, for our country. We thank you, God, for all that you've done in our past. But God, you see the sins of this land. You see the sins of this people. And Father, today we want to take our rightful place in humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And Lord, we repent on behalf of this people. We repent, Lord, as Daniel did in Daniel chapter 9. God, we repent on behalf of this country, O oh God. And we ask, Lord, that you would indeed forgive our sins. And that you would turn your face again toward us. And as you are sending warning sign after warning sign and as you are dealing bountifully and gracefully with us as it is indeed Romans 2 4 your kindness that is leading this country to repentance father we take our place if judgment begins let it begin at the house of God we take our place and we repent on behalf of our people on behalf of this country, on behalf of our leaders, Lord, we repent and we cry out to you today, heal our land. Send revival, O oh God, to this country. Let our pulpits be places of fire. Let our churches be places of fire, Lord God. Do a work that only the hand of God can do. Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you guys for those wonderful songs. I want to invite you this morning to turn to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Before I get into the text, I just want to share for just a second with you about uh, what the Lord has been speaking to me all weekend. Friday night, I had the opportunity to be at uh, some wonderful friends of ours. They were hosting a prayer gathering. There was probably 30 to 40 of us at this prayer gathering. And the Lord uh, led my friend, Pastor Doug Tweed, to minister on Ezekiel 37 on the Valley of Dry Bones. And we began to pray for our country, even there, prayed against the spirit of racism and division and all these things. And it was just a mighty, mighty prayer gathering. I, I just can't tell you all that the Lord ministered to my heart in, in that time. But one thing that the Lord showed me, in, uh, and I'm sure there's many who have seen this before, but for me, I had never seen it in the text. And when Pastor Doug was ministering on the Valley of Dry Bones and how the Lord spoke to Ezekiel and said, prophesy to the bones. And of course, if you know the scripture, there was a great noise and a rattling 
And bone came to bone, right? Joint to joint and flesh upon the bones. But I had never seen this in all of the times that I've read. I've never noticed what happened next. I know the story, but I never really, it never clicked. It ever happened to you with the Word of God? You know something, but then one day it clicks, you know? The light comes on. And here is this valley of dry bones that now has flesh and this, and this vast army, this mighty army. And Scripture says that Ezekiel tells the Lord, there's no breath in them. Now, I don't mean to read too much into the text, but it seems to me that if Ezekiel, by instinct, knew what to do next, he would have done it. But the way I read the text is Ezekiel didn't know what to do. That's why he tells the Lord, Lord, it happened, the miracle took place, but now, oh Lord, what? There's no, there's no breath in them. I imagine the scripture doesn't tell us, but I, I wonder how long Ezekiel stood there staring at it, not knowing what to do next. And I just, the Lord so ministered to me through this, because I don't know where some of you are, but I know I feel in my own spiritual journey, I'm about where Ezekiel stood at that moment. I've seen God do so much. I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen God do miracles up to a certain point, right? I've seen God answer prayer up to a certain point. But now, almost like Ezekiel, I feel like I'm staring at at some things I'm praying about, and as most everyone knows, my, this blindness, and, and, and there are people, salvations, that we've been fervently and earnestly calling on the Lord on their behalf. And I'm almost like Ezekiel where I'm saying, God, we've prayed for this person for so long, and we fasted over this person, and God, we've been praying for this wayward son, this wayward grandchild, this wayward husband or wife, and the list could just keep going. And I feel like at times I'm just standing there like Ezekiel going, Lord, there's no breath. There's nothing. I've seen a miracle up to the point, but God, it's not finished. And I'd never see, I never saw it in the text. When Ezekiel asked the Lord, he says, Lord, there's no breath in them. Then what did the Lord tell Ezekiel to do? Prophesy to the breath. And in that moment when Pastor Doug was so wonderfully speaking on this, the Holy Spirit began to minister to my heart and said, Chad, prophesy to the process. I'm in the waiting. You just keep on going. You don't stop. You don't back up. You don't question. You just keep on prophesying. Amen? And some of you have been praying for loved ones. You've been praying for grandchildren. You've been praying for deliverance for children in your life. You've been praying for miracles that only God can do. I'm praying for a miracle myself. And what would the Lord say to us this morning? Keep on prophesying. Amen? Keep on prophesying. Hallelujah. So I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're facing. But I know the Lord's telling me today to tell you, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't back down. You just keep on going. Amen. Revelation chapter 20 today. Uh, on our first two Sundays back in quarantine, the Lord laid a scripture on my heart concerning eternity. I think so many people are, perhaps for the first time in their lives, they are really thinking about serious matters, more serious than the bottom line of their jobs, or more serious than that next promotion, or getting that vacation home, or buying that new car, or whatever. I think many people, for the first time, are seriously contemplating the state of their souls. And so I wanted to do a two-week series before we jump into our Seven Churches of Revelation series beginning in June. I wanted to take opportunity and speak concerning the judgments that are to come. Last Sunday, we talked about the judgment, what Scripture calls the Bema 
judgment seat of Christ. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And we saw that if, if for some reason you weren't able to join us and you're just jumping into this, we saw that the bema, which simply means platform, it means step up. We talked about how a judge's, uh, in a judicial sense, a, a judge's bench or a judge's bar is elevated than those in the docket, right? It's the same in our culture today. It was the same in Paul's culture. We talked about an Olympic athlete winning medals would be on a bema, on a platform. We talked about military, how generals would give medals out on a bema or a platform. And what we saw was the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment of sin. It is not a judgment of whether or not an individual is saved. <clears throat> In fact, if you are at the judgment seat of Christ, it's because you are, in fact, born again. And you're a New Testament, grace, church age believer. <clears throat> and what we saw, we saw this beautiful scene of the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. How there is a number that no man could number. And who was around the throne of God? We answered all of this last week. It's believers it's the church age believers. Why do we say it's the church age believers? Because they were crowned with crowns. Only believers can win the five crowns of Scripture. Because they were clothed in white. Revelation 19.8. It's only the bride of Christ. It is the church bought, blood bought bride of Christ that will be clothed in the finest of white linen, Scripture says. Revelation 19.8. And because only church-age believers, number three, could sing worship songs unto the Lord. Only, only church-age believers can sing of the blood of the Lamb. Not angels, not Old Testament saints. And so we saw this great judgment, and, and, and here's what we said. This is not a judgment of sin, and it is not a judgment of whether or not you're saved. Rather, this is an evaluation of a believer's life. This is where the Lord will give rewards. And this is where we will stand before the Lord and God will reward the way that we live. And he'll try our works, 1 Corinthians 3. Either by, our works will either be hay, wood, stubble, or there will be gold, silver, and precious stone. And he'll try them by fire. And those who didn't live a worthless life wasteful life will have very precious things to give to the Lord Jesus Christ at this great judgment seat of Christ. So remember, the judgment seat, number one, is for believers only. There will not be any lost here. It's for believers. Number two, it is not for salvation. Rather, it is for rewards. Now, let's talk today about the great white throne. Now, the great white throne judgment is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 15. Perhaps it is the most sobering, the most fearful, the most serious words found in the entirety of the Bible. And I want to share this with you today with fear and with trembling. <coughs> I do not wish to just breeze through this information. This is uh, perhaps the most serious text in all of Scripture. Today I want to explain to you why it is called the great white throne judgment. I want to explain to you who will be there, <coughs> and I want to explain to you the finality of what Scripture says this event is. So number one, in verse 11, you'll notice John says, Then I saw a great white throne. Now why is this last and final judgment, this one of the last and final events of history, before our final and eternal state, why is it called great white throne? Well, if you're going to take notes, I want you to note this first of all. The word great in Greek is maga, M-A-G-A, maga. It simply means 
uh, great as in the sense if you are in a civil lawsuit and say you lost that lawsuit in a court, well, you can appeal to a higher court, right? Suppose you lose there. You can appeal to a higher court. But once you reach what is called the Supreme Court, if you lose in the Supreme Court, who else then can you appeal to? No one. There's no one greater than the Supreme Court. And when John uses the word great, maga, in the Greek, when he uses this word great, what he's really saying is this is absolute supreme. There will not be another appeal. There will not be another judgment. There will not be another chance. This court is the highest court of all of the universe of all of mankind. And that's why John first describes it as great, as in supreme. Now why is it called white? The white speaks of the purity of this court. It speaks of the purity of God's justice. You know, as well as I know, that in our legal system today, there is not always true justice. Is that right or wrong? I have actually been to court many times with uh, either people who asked me to join them or, you know, someone in our church got caught up in some kind of situation and they've asked me to go as a character witness or whatever the case is and I've actually been to court many times. And I remember this one time, I remember there was a young man standing before the judge and everyone in the room knew something bad was happening in the sense of <coughs> this young man was getting off very easy. And I'm sitting in my chair in this courtroom <clears throat> And the judge basically slaps him lightly on the hand and lets him go. And this man, instead of wearing his Sunday best, he, I think he had on his courtroom best because he looked like he'd been there a time or two. And he was a young man, probably in his mid-twenties, maybe late-twenties. And he thanked the judge soberly, cautiously, carefully, but when he turned around to the rest of us sitting in the courtroom, a sly grin came across his face. And I thought to myself then, he's learned nothing. He's learned nothing. And he walked out of that courtroom and justice was not truly done. We've all heard cases. We've all heard stories of where Justice was not served. Well, and on this day, when the books are open, and every man will give an account of his life and the deeds that he has done, not one thing will be missed by a sovereign God. Every sin, every misdeed, every wrongful action will be opened in the books. And God will not miss one single thing. Why is his throne called great? Because it is supreme and he is sovereign. Why is his throne called white? Because there is purity in his judgments. There is holiness in his judgments. That's the courtroom, what we see first of all. This is God's courtroom. Second, notice the judge then John says, and he who sat upon the throne. Who is he who sits upon the throne? John chapter 5 verses 22, 23, and 24 tell us. Jesus said that the Father judges no one. But Jesus said, the Father has given the Son all judgment. It will be Jesus Christ who is the judge at the great white throne judgment. And how fitting is it that the judge of the universe on that day is Jesus Christ? That the very one who men rejected 
will be the very one who judges them. It's quite fitting. Scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, that it is Jesus Christ who will judge both the living and the dead. See, I never really understood that text growing up. I always thought living and the dead meant either you're living, breathing, or you're dead and you've died. That's not what Paul's saying. Do you understand what Paul's saying? Spiritually alive and dead. He judges both those who are living. That will be the saved, the born again, when we stand at the Bema judgment seat of Christ, as we taught last Sunday. That is for born again. Those are the living. The dead are those who die in their sins. The dead are the spiritually dead that were without God and without hope in this world, according to Ephesians. So we see, first of all, the courtroom. We see, second of all, the judge. And who is the judge? It is no other than Jesus Christ. And he will faithfully execute judgment upon those who have rejected him. I was on an airplane some years ago. I was traveling to Cairo, Egypt to speak for a uh, conference there. And I had to connect in uh, Amsterdam, Netherlands. And it was on the flight home, and we were getting ready to cross the Atlantic. And those of you who've done that, you know what a long flight that is. And we're sitting on the the runway, and uh, I don't know why, but when I flew, when I had eyesight and I would travel and fly... I always sat down with chatty people. Does that ever happen to you when you fly? And I'm not chatty, not with strangers like that. Uh, Especially when I would fly, I would just want to put in my earbuds and write or journal or think or pray or whatever. But man, this guy wanted to talk. And he was was Dutch. He was uh, from Holland and he was a Dutchman and he was up in years He was not a young man at all. He was quite elderly. But he was a talker. And he talked and talked. And we're sitting there on the runway. And from the time he sat down and buckled up, from the time we took off, all he did was talk. I didn't even have to talk. I couldn't get a word in. And right as we got ready to lift off, he looked at me and said, Young man, what do you do for a living? I said, Well, I'm a pastor pastor a church and you know what his response was oh no oh no as bad as I hated sitting beside him now he got the right he got the same feeling right he's like oh no who have I sat beside well then all of a sudden guess what he wanted to talk about religion isn't that what lost people do they want to talk about religion I didn't want to talk about religion I have I had no I had nothing to say concerning religion. I wanted to talk about Jesus. And I'll never forget what this elderly Dutchman told me. I'll never forget it. I told you the story last week about the older man who came in my office and said, I got no problem with God. It's Jesus Christ I have a problem with. This elderly Dutchman said almost the same. He said, I, I don't know, I don't know if, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a God, but certainly not this Jesus. And that's who I wanted to talk about was Jesus. He had no interest in it at all. And do you know what he told me? He had no fear of Jesus Christ or of God Almighty. What a terrible state. You know, that was many years ago. I don't know if that man is still alive today. But listen, when you and I stand and give account for our lives, it will be Jesus Christ who we stand before. What have you done with him? Have you taken his name in vain and lived contrary to what he has said? Or do you love him and you obey him and you follow him You know, Pilate washed his hands of Jesus. 
You can't do that. You'll stand before him one day and you'll give account. He is the judge at the great white throne of God. Next, we see the defendants. Notice what the text says. John said after he saw the great white throne, we know what that means now, and he who sat upon the throne, who heaven and earth fled away, sky and earth fled from his presence. Notice what he said, then I saw the dead, both great and small. Wow, you know what John's saying? Now again, this isn't the living, the born again. <laughs> Jesus is going to judge, 2 Corinthians 4, 1, both the living and the dead, the righteous, the unrighteous, the sheep, the goats, the born again, the unbelievers. <clears throat> Who is at the great white throne? Who is the defense in God's courtroom? I'm sorry, the defendants. Who are the defendants in God's great white throne courtroom? It won't be born again people. Hallelujah. We'll not be there. We'll not witness this church. We'll not, we'll not stand before God in the great white throne. This is the dead. Not just physically dead. This is the spiritually dead. Not those who are made alive in Christ. According to Ephesians. You know it's interesting. It says both the small and the great. What's John mean by that? He means not only the great, the mighty, the powerful, the wealthy, the influential men of history, but also the insignificant men of history. Those who no one recorded their name, they'll not slip past a righteous God. Both the great and the small. No one will be too big and no one will be too insignificant. Think about that. You know... That Dutchman who was on that airplane ride with me that day, as I tried my best to share the gospel with him, I tried my very best as God enabled me to share the gospel. But you know what he told me? He said, I don't believe that when you die, there's more to come. He said, I just think that's it. You're dead. You're in the ground. Just like you had no, you had no existence before conception and you'll have no existence after death. You're just done. You're finished. You know what that's called? That's called the doctrine of annihilation. Listen carefully. This scripture alone proves that there is not a doctrine of annihilation. Every man, every woman who is apart from Christ will stand and give an account before him. And that includes Adolf Hitler. That includes Gandalfi. That includes Saddam Hussein and all of these people, Joseph Stalin and, and all these people who we see as terrible and wicked men. And that includes men that history never recorded their name. No one too great, no one insignificant. Everyone will stand before God. Those will be the defendants. So we've seen the courtroom, we've seen the judge, we've seen the defendants. Notice next, the evidence. What is the evidence in God's courtroom? Well, the Bible says, we'll call this Exhibit A, the Bible says that books will be opened. What are those books? If you read a, another verse or two down, it teaches that what's in these books are the deeds that are done by men. There'll be, there'll be, there'll be evidence. When men plead with God to have mercy upon them and not to condemn them to an eternal hell, no, there will be evidence against them. And the evidence will be the deeds of their lives. You know, I think how some people mock the Bible and they think, oh, how silly to think that every deed we've ever done is recorded. You really think that's silly? You really don't think that everything you say it's not captured somewhere. Right? Have you, have you had this happen to you recently? Have you just even had a conversation around your smartphone and all of a sudden you begin to get ads served to you about what you were talking about? What do you think is going on? Sadie and I can drive on Stone Drive past Chick-fil-A and all of a sudden a coupon will come to her phone. You know what that's called? That's called geofencing. 
You can walk down a grocery store aisle, past Tide, and all of a sudden get Procter & Gamble and Tide coupons come to your phone. It's called geofencing. Let me ask you a question. Do you not think heaven has far better and far more sophisticated technology than we do? And you really think in this age where you cannot go to any business, you cannot drive down any road without being recorded. Everywhere you go, you are recorded. Is that right or wrong? You walk into my counseling office and you'll be recorded. Everywhere, everywhere. And you don't think heaven is not keeping a detailed account of your life. You would be foolish to think otherwise. When not only the Bible tells us so, but our culture, our society says it as well. The evidence. Now, some scholars think that not only is there going to be the evidence of the deeds of our lives, some scholars believe that the Word of God itself will be one of these books. I tend to agree with them. Our lives will be judged based upon our response to the Word of God. But then there's another exhibit, there's another evidence, exhibit B. There's not only the books, but there's what Scripture teaches as the book of life. And listen to what it says. It, well, go back to Luke chapter 10. Do you remember what Jesus told his followers the first time he sent them out? And they came back rejoicing, saying that even demons are subject to us under your name. And do you remember what Jesus said? He said, don't rejoice at these things, but rather rejoice that your names are in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Those whose name, Revelation 20 is clear. Those whose name was not found in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. Friends, God's sentencing, God's verdict will be just. And he'll have the books of the deeds of men and women's lives. He'll have the word of God, no doubt. And he'll have the book of life. And with all of that evidence, how will anyone be able to stand before the great white throne and present an argument? No, friends, they won't. Warren Wiersbe said it so well. This is the only court that will have a judge but no jury. That will have a sentencing with no appeal. There is a finality to this verdict. So we've seen the courtroom, the great white throne. We've seen the judge, Jesus Christ, he who sits upon the throne. We've seen the defendants, the spiritually dead, both great and small, all of mankind who are not born again will stand before this great judgment on this great judgment day. We've seen the evidence, exhibit A, the books, exhibit B, the book of life. And now lastly, we see the verdict and the sentencing. The verdict will be guilty as the books are examined. And scripture says that death and Hades gave up their dead, and the sea gave up their dead. You know why John says the sea? In, in, in ancient times, the sea was uh, regarded as the most, uh, what's the word I want to use there? It was the most, um, oh, come on, Chad. Uh, I can't find the word I want to use. It was the last place man could ever go to. It's, it helped me out, somebody. Who's a wordsmith? You can't go there. It's uh, unattainable. Yeah, there you go. And uh, it was seen as you can't go to the depths. And somebody died and was buried in the sea. There's no, no. And John's saying, it doesn't matter who you are or how you died or where you are. You will stand before Almighty God. 
Now the sentencing, notice what it says. It says that both death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire and whoever their name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. And this is what scripture calls it. This is the second death. And isn't that interesting? The Bible calls, see, some people don't realize this because they've never been taught. Hell is not eternal, just like heaven is not eternal. One day, we will, those who are in heaven now, and if we live long enough that we pass and go to heaven, we won't stay in heaven for all of eternity. One day, God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth with a new Jerusalem. And that's where we'll dwell in our final eternal state. And it's the same in hell. Hell is not for eternity. What is eternal is what Scripture calls the lake of fire. The lake of fire. And hell will be thrown into the lake of fire. What a sobering thought. And to think what determines this is what you do with Jesus. What determines this is if you... If you make him Lord of your life and you follow him, you love and obey him. What a sobering thought. But watch this. Now watch this. I'm closing with this. See, this is why Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. You know, if you watch any kind of television today, what do they do? They make fun of born again Christians. Oh, but they have no idea what awaits them. What scripture calls the second death. See, David Jeremiah says it so well. He says, if you're only born once, that physical birth out of your mother's womb, unfortunately, you're going to die twice. You'll die a natural death and you'll die this great spiritual death of Revelation chapter 20. But see, if you're born twice... <laughs> If you're born of your mother's womb naturally, but then you're born again of God's Spirit, then guess what, my friends? We only die once. And that's the physical death. Amen? And we'll never, ever, ever, hallelujah, we'll never die again. Ever. The Scripture calls this the second death. See, what awaits believers, think about this. After you and I die, that physical, natural death, that's if Christ doesn't return. But if we die, that natural, physical death, Paul says, these tents in which we groan, it'll be taken off. We'll take off mortality. We'll put on immortality. And do you know what awaits us? Eternal life. Hallelujah. The tree of life. The water of life. The river of life. That's what awaits us. But what awaits those who are apart from Christ? The second death in eternity in a Christless, in a hopeless lake of fire. Oof. What a sobering thought. So let me warn you, my friends. Why don't you stay off of Google this week? Why don't you get off Facebook this week? Why don't you not shop this week? Why don't you just step aside from your hobbies and your television shows? And why don't you examine your soul? And why don't you see based on the evidence of the word of God, where will you be on this great and final judgment day? Where will you be? See, what I see in this text that breaks my heart, but let me tell you what I see in all of the New Testament, there's grace. There's grace. Right now, today, there's grace. Just as there's oxygen richly within our atmosphere, there's grace. But do you know what is absent from Revelation 20, 11 through 15? There is no grace. None. There are no redos. There's no going back. There's no repentance, and there's no grace to repent. This is a finality that can never be reversed. This is why the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto man to die once, and after this, 
the judgment. Do you know what that verse is really saying? See, I always thought it just meant it's appointed unto man to die a one-time death. You can't die and come back and re-die again. Although Lazarus did it. <laughs> but that's not what it means. That's not what it means. Listen to what it means. It is appointed unto man to die once. You know what it's really saying? Before the judgment, you have one opportunity to die right. To die right with the Lord. You know, my dad wasn't saved until the last 15 years of his life. But I'm so thankful that when my dad took his last breath on this earth, I can say with confidence, my dad died in Christ. And blessed are those who die in the Lord. Can you see why that verse means so much? Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Because, friends, they'll never stand before the great white throne judgment. They'll never face a second death. They'll never be thrown into the lake of fire. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Hallelujah. And what awaits those? Life. Life. Eternal life. What about you today? What awaits you? What awaits you? Let me tell you, my friends, your sin, I don't care what sin you're loving right now, it's not worth your soul. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And don't be deceived. Don't think that you're going to live a sinful life and God wink at you. No, friends, you choose that, you'll stand before the great white throne and his judgment will be just. There's no repentance there, but there is repentance here. There's no grace there, but there is grace here. Let's pray right now. God, I don't know who you're dealing with, whether in the building or those watching online. But, oh God, would you convert them? Would you soundly convert them? Let them pass. <laughs> John 5, 24, let them pass from death unto life. <laughs> from death unto life. You're without Christ. You're without Him today. I want you to pray right now with me. And be assured, it is not this prayer that will save you. It is repentance that will save you. A turning, a turning away from your sin and a turning toward the Lord. You need the grace of God. You need the mercy of God. You need the forgiveness of God. I want you to pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, forgive the sins of my life. Forgive my rebellion. And accept me as a child of God. Save and redeem me. And I give you my life for all eternity. Spare me from second death. Spare me from the great white throne judgment. Place my judgment upon Christ. And may I be found in Him. In Jesus' name. Amen.